as you may know, I was on a short vacation during that time. Julian Alfred did wonderful things for our country. You also know that during that period, we launched the first ever semi-professional football league in St. Lucia. Uh, we have ongoing works at the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds. And uh, we are also at our final stages of our youth policy. Shoot. All right. So yesterday we saw the launch, well, the first match day of the semi-professional football league. Um, from your, you were at the games. Tell me what did you see um, based on the performance of both teams in terms of the actual football first, and then the. Sorry. In terms of the actual football, you will appreciate in every in every single league, uh, semi-pro or professional league, when you have two tiers, you have a first, uh, like a first division, a second division, you would find that the teams at the bottom, playing in the bottom league, which is what we saw in the first game, um, lacking some of the cutting edge that you're looking for. So in terms of the Babano versus Marsha game, it was not as entertaining, not many shots on goal. As a matter of fact, the only shot on goal was the penalty that Babano converted in the final minutes of that game. And so there's a lot to be desired, but it also explained to us, uh, to St. Lucia, and of course those communities, why they are in the second tier. And of course, when you have a competition with relegation and promotion, uh, you would know that these teams are trying to get into the main end of the St. Lucia Semi-Professional Football League. And so there was a lot to be desired by those two teams in terms of fitness, in terms of technique, but I know for sure they will be going back to the drawing board and they'll be doing their best. The second game is pretty much what uh, a lot of people would expect in terms of uh, when you look at football in England, you look at the, the English Premier League, you look for games between uh, a Liverpool and an Arsenal, you look for games between a Chelsea and Arsenal, or Manchester United and Arsenal, not the constant. Um, you, you would know that this is the top tier of football in England, so yeah. it would be night and day in terms of what you, saw, what you see. And of course, that game was a better game. Grosley came out on top, naturally 1-0 against Leclerc, who came in as champions. Um, and so, um, still a lot to be desired, even in the top tier game, in terms of finishing, in terms of execution, in terms of game planning, in terms of fitness, because clearly you could have seen Leclerc being slightly the feeder of the two teams, because the last 15 minutes of that game, you saw a lot of pressing by Leclerc um, as two champions trying to get back into that game. But Grosley held the note, they did what they had to do, and they were victorious. And so, in our first ever semi-pro day, Grosley came out on top 1-0, and of course, Babano defeated Marsha 1-0. I'm not, not I'm digressing too much from the issue, mm -hmm. but the facility, um, we had a short inspection at the facility. I don't know if that's been brought to your attention, mm -hmm. but the Marsha facility you know, was once you know, brilliant. But from the top floor, there's still a burnt, the burnt structure is entirely, I know we have you know, visitors coming in and there's a lot of preparation. Would you take taking all these amenities, the distance? The, 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 you know? Thank you very much for that question. It allows me to go back because we have very short term memory in this country. When we came in as government, if you looked at the Mindo Philip Park and what we saw yesterday, night and day, the stands on the on the on the right hand side that did not exist and it was not available for patrons for the last five six almost eight years that has been done the roofing on that side that has been done the main side uh, as well the roof was totally damaged we have done work there Rome was not built in a day but we have certainly over the last two years done a lot of work on the Mindo Philip Park this week as a matter of fact today you will see commencement on the area that you speak of, which is the players' pavilion, um, that entire area will be upgraded um, before Cricket World Cup. So what you saw yesterday and what you will see in the next two weeks will be totally different. I am very proud of the work we've done at the Mindo Philip Park, given the fact that for a five, almost six year period, there was absolutely no attention given to the Mindo Philip Park. And we do. There was a certain doctrine that supported that sort of action. And right now, for the first time in so many years, the launch of a semi-professional football league was held at the Mindo Philip Park. 
And I mean, we, everybody commented on the fact that for so long, we've not seen so many people at the Mendefele Park enjoying football. And that, as a government, we can take pride in. We deliberately decided to bring football back to the Mecca. Uh, Castries football has been on a downturn for a number of years. And under my watch, it will not continue. We will be moving to the works at the VG playing field after budget. Uh, we have a lighting project that we're going to do at VG with Pavilion so that Central Castries can have a home next year in the semi-professional football league. So maintenance will be maintained at, at Marsha? Oh, absolutely. So well, Marsha is the, the, the pride and joy of the Prime Minister. And so we'll be seeing the commencement of works on the Pavilion for Marsha because we know that football is primarily played at Marsha and of course cricket and track and field at the Mendefele Park. And so next year's semi-pro league, we are expected that by that time, the Marsha playing field will be available for Marsha's home games. Um, similar to that, Grosley, we are commencing work next week on the Grosley Mini Stadium. And so we'll be seeing the blockade, the pavilions, the washroom facilities for Grosley. So Grosley will have their home venue for the semi-professional league. And another thing I must note, yesterday we were actually having a complaint. And one of the biggest complaints we were having was from the vendors who said that all their drinks were sold out. And I mean, that is something that we are very happy about. What the vision is, is for Grosley, who has their franchise, to have their vending at the Grosley playing field to, to really support the initiative of maintaining the playing field and, of course, compensating the staff and that sort of thing. And so that is a vision for all the constituencies. And, of course, it's not going to happen in just one tune. But come our next term, we would see that most of the playing fields would have a home venue so that the semi-professional league could be what we truly want it to be. Should this initiative, you know, be successful in the future? I, I know I'm speaking ahead of myself, mm -hmm. but do we see a copying and a pasting of, of that idea on another spot maybe? So to semi-professionalize something else, if, I know this is far ahead in the future, but... Um, Not that? so far. Okay, As a well, matter of fact, the, the same amount of uh, let's just say attention that football is getting, we do intend to move in that direction with cricket as well. We do have a SPL, St. Lucia Premier League. Uh, it's for about a month or two. We do intend to work with the organizers. Uh, we encourage private enterprise. So we do have a private individual involved in that. The idea is to continue to give support and to give more support so it could be expanded into a league that is beyond five and six months. In the sport of cricket, we've done another thing that is novel and historic in St. Lucia's history. We actually have a high performance uh, center for our best cricketers. These cricketers are also being compensated, meaning on a monthly basis, they are compensated about $1,500 that goes in their pocket to deal with whatever circumstances that befall them. So they have the, the option of being part of the high performance center, uh, making that money, and of course still having a job that pays them perhaps the same amount or even more to ensure that their livelihoods are upgraded. This is the vision of the St. Lucia Labour Party in this government to ensure that young people are engaged in meaningful ways. Okay, recently online there have been some discourse surrounding Julian Alfred and Turley Holland. Some are saying it's too early, some are saying it's not too early now. What is your take on that? Thank you for that question. You see, we have to be strategic as a government. The season has only just begun. We have the Olympics, uh, that's in July, so we do, have, uh, this, we do have a long season for Julian Alfred. The expectation is that Julian is going to medal at every event. So if Julian participates and medals in every event, are we going to bring her down every single time she medals? So we have to think about what's happening, the trajectory. The fact of the matter is, after the Olympics, this government is going to put on a celebration for Julian Alfred like we've never seen before. Whether she medals or not, and we all anticipate that she is going to medal, we are going to make pronouncements, some of which we've already begun discussing, on how it is that we honor her so that generations to come can pretty much understand what she's done for this country, including her community, including you know some of the things that I can't let the cat out of the bag. But certainly, this government has been a government of historic achievements in sports. Go check our, our track record. Every single development thrust in sports has been under this government. And so her legacy is not one we're going to let fall by the wayside. What she's done this year is not something that we're going to just allow to pass off. So to answer your question, we will be celebrating Julian. 
but we're going to wait for this historic season to come to an end, come to its logical conclusion, as the member from Labry would say, and then we're going to put on a vibe like we've never seen around the island in celebration of Chilean Alfred. $100,000 from First National into sports. Happy about the private sector involvement, participation, support. It's really nice when a plan actually comes to fruition. When we first announced that we were going to take school sports to the weekend, we, were, we got so many criticisms. People were saying, oh, the Catholic Church would never agree. Oh, the Adventist Church would never agree. And we kept saying to people, madness, insanity is doing something the same way and expecting a different result. The fact of the matter is the corporate sector involvement in into schools, Island Champs, it depleted significantly because of the ROI, the lack of it, the lack of return on investment. You have a track and field tournament happening during the week. You don't have parents in the stands. You don't have the public in the stands. You only have school students who have zero, no, I shouldn't say zero, a limited buying power into the activities of the corporate sector. How it is, how do you sell the sport to them and give them a return on the investment. And so we saw sponsorship going all the way down. And as we said, if we bring this thing on the weekend, corporate sponsors will come and support this activity. First National, this is not their first time getting involved in the development of our fleets in St. Lucia. We see it, historic move, $100,000 invested in our inter-schools competition, the Island Champ being moved to a Sunday. So this Sunday, the 17th of March, we will see from two o'clock the first ever inter school championships where parents could attend, where family members could attend, the general community. So it's no longer going to be a school's event, but a national event that exposes our young talent to all of St. Lucia and the rest of the world. And so I am extremely excited that this was another promise made by this administration that we are fulfilling because uh, the young people really deserve the attention for their hard work, and we're going to see that being done this weekend. You mentioned the youth policy. What is that? Okay, so the national youth policy is really going to drive how young people's development is affected over the next couple of years. And of course, my ministry, charged with the responsibility of youth development, they are going to be pretty much put in a policy which sets the tone for how this is exercised by government. It's going to be law. So, I mean, there are a couple of declarations in there. It's a document, a policy document that we've been working on for a long time. And uh, sometimes people forget that it's a ministry of youth development and sports. Um, a lot of the time, sports take most of the attention. And we believe that young people have a major role to play in the development of this country. And so with that policy, it's going to chart the way forward and identify exactly how we're going to do it, how society is going to come on board, and how we're going to actually shape the future of our next generation. Coming very soon. Last one. Mm -hmm. Going back to semi pro sports, mm -hmm. critics, detractors who believe government should be far away from sports administration. Mm -hmm. uh, what say your response to that? I say they are correct. I say you are correct in saying that government needs to stay as far as far away as possible from the actual commercial aspect of sport. And this is actually the vision that this government have for a semi pro league. We needed to get a start. We could not have continued to just stay on the sideline and have people say that football is not developing, our young people are playing, they are training for multiple hours and they are not getting compensated. A lot of them were on the blocks. I can say to you that yesterday I sat in the stands and I watched individuals that on a Sunday afternoon would have been shot at, literally shot at, in Grosley on the playing field. And I felt to myself, this is where they need to be. They got back into playing football. The Grosley people will know individuals that I'm speaking about. They are into meaningful activity. And the thing that is lost with the semi-pro league that I need to say again, the tagline is pretty much developing, using, leveraging football to transform lives. And this is what we need to continue to understand. We are leveraging football to transform lives. So with this program, we are going to be having a parenting workshop for these young men. We know that a lot of the complaints are about fathers in the household and their role. 
And so with this program, we're going to be bringing all the young men into a room to have discussions, to train them on what it means to be a father in a modern world. With this program, we've also signed an MOU with the Ministry of Education and NSDC and the Taiwanese government to provide the finances, over $200,000 in finances for skills development in terms of anybody who wants to be a plumber, anybody who wants to be a carpenter, a bartender, a massage therapist. We have over 15 items identified as training options for those young men. And so the development thrust is not just about paying people to go and kick a ball, but to actually leverage football to transform their lives. Money management is another program that we are going to have because uh, some of these footballers, some will be making 15, some will be making $2,000 a month for the first time in their life. And so at the end of the day, we want to speak to them about how do you invest? How much do you save? What percentage do you, if uh, for some people, tithe? How do you actually use your money to sustain your livelihood? And so this semi-pro league is something that I am extremely passionate about, simply again because of my experience. I've said this many times. I was a national footballer. I went and kicked ball all over the world for St. Lucia. When I got injured, I had to deliver my injury myself. So the sum total of money I made from football is less than 20, negative $20,000. So anybody who kicks a ball right now for a first division team is making more money than I made for my entire career from playing football. They and this is what we have to do. Criticize the quote unquote paltry sums paid to these uh, semi professional players. Do you have any response? Yeah, again, this is this is what we, we speak about in terms of government being removed. By the time the corporate world understands what's going on in terms of semi pro football, we will be asking people to send proposals to sponsor and we'd have to pick and choose because the amount of attention uh, the return on investment these companies can have would definitely trigger them to come to gravitate towards the league we have in proposals coming through right now for sponsorship uh, tagline sponsorship would be in excess of five hundred thousand dollars for some leagues and so we will be able to as time goes by uh, compensate footballers better and better and you have to understand that this is the first year so we don't expect to be paying footballers five thousand dollars in the first year but by year three and four the expectation is we'd have through transfers there are a couple of footballers i saw yesterday that i would want to play for grossly and so the transfer fee and the amount they may have to be compensated for coming and play for grossly may be in excess of three thousand dollars for the month but these things don't happen in the first year the first year, you have the football, you pay attention to what's going on, and you definitely make adjustments going forward to strengthen your team and to ensure that players are better compensated. Would there be media engagement courses as well in the, the training? I know that's an important aspect of athletes, you know. So a huge component of the semi-pro league that has not been put out there is the collaboration with the Youth Economy Agency. So this... This, this government is about synergy. This government is about working together to ensure that all walks of life, uh, all the resources are brought together to ensure that whatever initiative we have uh, flourishes. And so under the Youth Economy Agency, the partnership with the Semi Pro League and the Ministry of Sports would allow for training for individuals and financing. As a matter of fact, right now, if you have an idea that you know could bring some level of uh, of equity and, 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 and promotion of the semi-pro league, you have that business idea. You are in a position where you can put a proposal together and go to the youth economy agency and get funding in the first instance of up to $5,000 for that business idea. Once it's an idea that is well thought of, put together, and we could see it's been, it being sustained. And so right now, I mean, persons that are involved in photography, videography, that can actually get something, put something together uh, in collaboration with the semi-pro league, and actually go to the Youth Economy Agency could definitely benefit from it. Okay. Anything on sport betting in the future? <laughs> sport betting is something that we cannot avoid. Um, growing up, I had my positions on sports betting and of course uh, the impact it's had on families and it continues to have on families. But it's something that I know as a minister is in the modern age is, is spreading like wildfire. And so we expect for it to continue with this league. Um, we right now have video lotteries from both Cage and um, from um, CBN. And so we expect that this eventually will be infiltrated and it will only, at the end of the day, uh, contribute to the whole 
environment that is sports and sports development and competition and financing. Um, we just have to be careful to ensure that part of our programs is ensuring that our footballers are on the street and narrow in terms of you know any way they may be able to contaminate the sporting competition. And so um, we know that this is something that, that is that is alive and well, and we're certainly hoping that it will become part of any football competitions that we promote. That's a good one. That's a good question. Any updates on the ICC T20? Program? Yes, updates on the ICC T20. I did give some. The works on the Minda Phillip Park, they commenced today in terms of the pavilion aspect of things, and work will continue on the surface of the Minda Phillip Park. Next week, we're expecting the commencement of work on the Grosley playing field in terms of um, transforming the Grosley playing field into a Grosley mini stadium. I don't like that name. We will find an individual from Grosley to name the field after eventually. Um, and so the Darren Sammy Cricket Ground, uh, if you pass a Darren Sammy at 10 o'clock in the night, you will still see work ongoing in terms of the roof a totally new roof, a modern roof, um, able to withstand the sea blast from Kazaba Beach um, is being constructed right now. Um, the plain surface is being redone because we know we had issues with flooding and uh, water logs on the Darren Sami. And of course the technology for the spider cams and for all the cameras and the media center, that has already commenced as well. And so we're expecting work to be completed by the end of April at all three of these venues. We are going to have to work night and day, and we're certainly expecting that St. Lucia will put on a very, very good World Cup event. Minister and Minister for Tourism, Investments, Creative Industries, Culture, and Information, Honorable Dr. Ernest Thiele. Good morning to all. Today I'm taking questions. St. Lucia recently um, won the award for, I think, best, best corporate retreat. retreat. I know that, that that was a strive that the government was trying to do, you know, to get um, St. Lucia more recognition in that regard. Yeah. Speak to the significance of this award. For us. Uh, for us, it is hugely significant, and I want to start off by um, saying congratulations to the many stakeholders in St. Lucia that made that possible, the Central Tourism Authority, the hotels, uh, the destination management companies that certainly um, do a lot of the work for this to become a reality. For us, it's a big deal. It really matters to us. Um, we have plans in terms of the development of the tourism industry for us to expand the MICE um, um, segment of it and for us to be able to be recognized at this early stage as a Caribbean best corporate retreat is a big deal. Uh, we made a very determined effort last year um, to facilitate and to promote the hosting of events um, as well as meetings, conferences in St. Lucia. So for us, you know, to, to have received that um, that early um, was, you know, really um, exciting. And we will continue to work to promote, you know, that area and we certainly looking forward to the commencement of the Grand Hyatt in Strozel, which will be specializing in that area, um, meetings, conferences, um, incentives, whatnot. So, you know, we're really, really excited by it. Um, with the recent exploits of Julian Alfred on the world stage, um, there have been talks about sports tourism, how we could really develop sports tourism. What has been done to yeah. Well, a few years ago, under previous Labour Party government, we had placed sports tourism, you know, right at the forefront. In fact, some of you who are old enough may remember Reds Pereira actually served as a sports consultant at the tourist board then. Um, and we did quite a lot. I recall those days I was permanent secretary for youth and sports then. And we, we, we did a lot, especially attracting um, schools cricket out of the UK. Um, during Easter break, as well as during the, the, the summer. Uh, it was well established. We hosted a number of OECS events, and of course with Reds Pereira, a lot was done to promote OECS, you know, marathon, OECS swimming, netball, quite a lot. Um, we are building for us to, to, to set up again a very, very active, you know, sports tourism calendar. Um, the Ministry of Tourism has done a lot in promoting alternative sports, alternative sports, and that is super exciting for us. There's some changes that have taken place in the market from then compared to now. 
So for example, I can say to you, it was sometimes very embarrassing for us when we brought down cricketers, netball teams from the UK, whatnot, and they go out to the rural communities and you know, persons want to use toilets and you know, other facilities and they did not exist. And, and that was sometimes very challenging for us. Over the last few years, many of the facilities around the island have been upgraded. Um, you look at in Denry North, you have a very um, almost, I mean, Denry North, Larry Shows playing field can host first class cricket. That's how good it is in terms of size, facilities, and lights. Um, you have in Denry, you have um, not so much Miku, um, especially with the, the vulgarity that took place to put artificial turf there, but that's another story. Um, you can go to Viewfort and Soufre. Um, so, so a lot of the facilities have been upgraded and that's what we need. Because if we are going to invite schools and other professional teams to come to St. Lucia, we have to be able to offer them the very best facilities. And of course, you can understand the standards have really risen. So we are preparing ourselves at the Tourism Authority. Uh, we have some big targets in, in the coming years. Sports tourism is one, diving is another one. Um, but we, you, you will see a, a greater effort being made to promote. I think in the summer, this summer, we have quite a lot of sports that will be taking place. We have World Cup Cricket, CPL, we have the English Tour hopefully coming on. Um, we have your know, swimming coming on and we are looking at a couple of other areas. Recently for independence, we had the drag racing and drag racing, as you know, is big um, in this part of the region. We have been working for Invest St. Lucia um, to support the development of that of that sport. So yes, um, just take note, next couple of years, St. Lucia will become the place to come in the Eastern Caribbean for sports tourism. Yeah, uh, and this is the addition of the semi pro league will help with that as well in that regard? With, sorry? The addition of the semi pro football league will help in that No, no, regard. the semi professional football takes it to a different level. Um, the semi professional football is not just about sports. It's an economic initiative. It's a social initiative, as well as a sporting initiative. Many years we, we've, we've reflected on how do we make our athletes world class. And to, to create a high performance athlete, you need to have multiple um, facets in place. And we've often heard our sports people say that they have to hustle a living. They have to find a job. And they, don't all, they do not always have the time to focus on their sporting development. The semi-professional league offers an opportunity now for footballers to be able to spend more time focusing on skill development and personal development and have to worry less about where their next meal coming from, where their next you know, um, money, is, the money is coming from because they are going to receive support to be able to do so. So they can spend more time you know, um, training, rehabilitation. Um, even reading and, and even personal development because reading is an essential part of it. I, I tell young athletes so often, you know, you want to be a world-class athlete and sometimes you don't even know the history of the sport that you're involved in. Sometimes you have to, when, when you go online, rather than read all the other things online, read about your sport, read about the great ones in your sport, what they did to succeed, read about the great athletes, the mindset they developed, the, 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 the regime they developed for success. There's so much that you can learn but if you have to worry about having to go and hustle a living today, go and break a job tomorrow, it distracts you from that, even down to your nutrition. You know, guys tell you, you know, if, you know, if you're going to be a high performance athlete, you have to eat right. You have to know what's the, the proper regime you have to follow. The semi professional league will do all of that. So it's an economic activity in terms of engaging young persons in some form of employment, but it's also too vital for their personal and professional development, learning how to tie a tie, how to use a knife and fork, you know, how to fill out immigration forms, simple things like that you believe are, are not necessary, but all that is part of what you're reading up on nutrition, what foods you must eat, what foods you must not eat, and, and whatnot. So it, it is a fantastic addition to our sports um, development program in St. Lucia, but it's also very critical as it deals with social development because we have a large group of young men that we've now pulled in into a very productive um, pathway. So I I'm really excited about it. And I was glad I was there yesterday um, to see the first matches and to see the first goal that was scored. Um, just, just one second. Um, Normally, starting at the infancy and semi-pro is 
infancy. Um, and I know that the government is the one who's pushing the initiative for the semi pro league. Um, in terms of integrating it across the OECS at the very least, to make countries have similar ideas that will come together in the franchising element of it, could be just like, I guess, the Europe Cup, the yeah, Euro yeah, Cup yeah. and that kind of stuff. Are there any plans or intentions to have that kind of development? Well, I mean, I can't speak about what the Ministry of Sports plans are, but I can tell you, this is one step at a time. Let's take the baby steps, and then we'll start running very soon. Um, I'm, I'm hoping it can evolve because I think at the, the already I know there's the Nations Cup within the CFU and whatnot. So they, they have their own structure, their own processes. Um, remember, government is like the financier of the link together with the FA. Um, so our interest is to get it going and to make it happen. Um, and the relevant sporting association will follow their own pathway as how it's done. But government, for government, it's really critical that we get this going. I'm hoping too we'll have a semi-professional um, SPL. Well, we've had one before, the T20, St. Lucia Professional League T20, which attracted big crowds, you know, at Moses and other parts of the island. So I'm hoping we too can put something in place for the cricketers. You know, I often argue and people sometimes, we have debates with my friends about it. I tell them there are free sports that we, we world class in. Um, well, two sports really, we will class in from, from, from junior level. That's cricket and track and field, if you think about it. A 15-year-old in St. Lucia can be among the best in the world. A 15-year-old sprinter in St. Lucia or any track athlete can be among the best in the world. And we have shown that we can be the best in those two sports at junior level. So, you know, we, we should nurture and propagate it as much as possible. Yes, in terms of our um, buried resources, you know, say that I can't talk about sports development per se. I think the right person is the Minister of Sports to do so, to really speak about that. But of course, you know, it, it is part of the, the program. We certainly, for us, in tourism, we do, um, like you say, be very involved in yachting and the, the cruise, the yacht cruises. So um, it is big for us in tourism. But in terms of sporting development, I think the best can can talk about us. Well, I think we're waiting for the Prime Minister to present on the 23rd. We're super excited again about the presentation of the estimates. I know for a fact, from my ministry perspective, we have a lot to see. Um, we have a lot to report on. Um, so I can't say it now, <laughs> but I mean, just to give you a, a, a sense, you know, we are investing heavily in community tourism. Only last week, some of you were present where we had the signing ceremony for more investment in infrastructure for community tourism. Um, we will be investing a lot more in the creative industries this year. So you'll hear a lot about the creative industries and the support that it gets. You'll hear a lot more about the increased support for Carnival, for example and our cultural expressions. Um, you'll hear a lot more about our support for La Rose and La Marguerite and for emancipation. So, I mean, I hope I get more than an hour to speak about all the things I, I want to, 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 to um, discuss because the government is invested heavily in those sectors. Um, and of course, for tourism, our numbers are, are excellent. Um, when I last spoke to you, I told you January um, was above what it was for 2019 and our best January ever. Um, February is also the best February we've ever had. So um, for January and February this year, our numbers are even better than last year and better than 2019. So we are on course for um, if all goes well and, and God looks over us to have a, an excellent year in terms of our numbers. So our numbers are increasing. We passed the Tourism Development Bill, so we're restructuring the tourism industry. We invested more in community tourism to put more for the average solution to participate and own the tourism industry. Um, so on, at all levels, um, we can boast of tremendous success. Any, any issue of, of taxes and uh, 
Okay. Well, I've not heard of any. Um, yeah, I've not heard of any. I think so. I know that religious tourism is something that you guys are looking at yeah. currently. Um, what aspects of that would the government, like for your ministry in particular, like to highlight, and yeah. how can it become something for? Well, it, it's a new yeah, it's a new area for us. And last week, in the agreement we signed with the CARICOM Development Fund, um, it provides for financing for a project together with the Catholic Church, the address and uh, address is um, at the cathedral for us to be able to um, introduce in there um, a visitor experience. And of course, you would have recall a few years ago the incident that took place at the cathedral and the loss of lives. Um, so there is going to be a free matters shrine, a shrine erected with a narrative, a story about what happened and the importance of it to the Catholic faith. And it will be an opportunity for persons to come and visit the church and in addition to what you traditionally would do in a church to get an opportunity. Now for those of you who may have traveled to other parts of the world and have seen some of those um, experiences, um, it, it, it is quite a, a rewarding experience from the perspective of spirituality, but also too in terms of its tourism component to be able to attract um, visitors. For us it enhances the um, reputation of Castries as a city and as a destination that visitors who come into this country, there'll be more to see in Castries. Um, there's a lot of work to be done in Castries and upgrading Castries, and this certainly will add to it. Some of the plans the government, ha ha um, the government has for Castries, um, you know, we will assist as well. I think you know that very shortly, um, the old Ministry of Education building will be broken down, um, the Halls of Justice um, will be erected and, and add to the look and feel of the city. And there's a lot that's going to happen. So I think the religious tourism is another exciting component that we are adding. So we're working with the church on it. Okay. Um, is there an update on the party? I understand that on Friday there would have been a ceremony or something of that sort. No, there's not a ceremony, there's a meeting with the developers. Um, so we had a, a meeting on Friday, the developers, um, DCA, Invest and Lucha, the Ministry of Tourism, and the parliamentary reps for the area where we looked at the proposals um, that they put forth in terms of the development of the, the project. And it, it was quite a lengthy meeting, but we made sure we covered all aspects of it. So the parliamentary reps can now go back and speak to their constituents about it. DCA was updated on what was proposed, and the developer now will take it to the next stage. Uh, we've been very particular about it to make sure all stakeholders are on the same page. But for us, it's a very critical project because, you know, for years, since 2008, it's 14 years that site has been abandoned, and it's an eyesore. Um, it's the, the loss of hope of what could have happened for those coastal communities. So um, we're very determined to work with develop, a developer to make it real. But at the same time, we equally committed to make sure that we observe all the necessary protocols and all the necessary precautions that will still safeguard the area for what it is. Um, you know, it's an excellent question, and you know, if you had university, there would be a whole course in political economy of tourism, um, and, and for us to really examine all the arguments, because whilst I, you may not agree with some of those arguments, there is some basis for those sentiments, and is how do you address it? Now, there are people that would not support tourism blanket. No matter what you tell them, what arguments you put before them, they will not support it because they don't like the symbolism of having the country's economic growth, economic development, dependent on persons from outside having to come in. There are some people that are what you call autarkic. They, they believe you can only develop if you only develop from within. 
the truth is in an interdependent world you cannot really develop like that anymore you need to have relations with other countries and be interdependent and that's the reality of the global political economy so we, we need to um, be able to trade what we have competitive advantages in what do we have the most competitive advantage in tourism we cannot produce, make manufacture cars cheaper than Japan and the United States. We cannot make refrigerators and televisions. We cannot make semiconductors cheaper than anybody else. How many things can we produce in this world and be the most competitive about it? Well, we don't have oil, we don't have diamonds, we don't have uranium. What do we have? We have the beauty of the country, we have the warmth of the people, and we know how to offer the best experiences in the world. And that's what we have in, in this region of the world. We are the world leaders in doing that. We are limited by size because we're not large territories, we're small islands. And therefore, when you look at the numbers, it can be daunting that your country have 170,000, 80,000 persons, but yet 1.2 million people will come to your country for the year, either both for cruise and overnight. So I can see why some people have an aversion toward, towards that. And then you have people who believe that um, tourism requires that we give up the best parts of St. Lucia to be occupied by foreigners, whether on the beaches or whether the forest, the rainfalls, the rainfalls, the waterfalls, the you know, um, rivers, whatnot, and they don't like it. Um, they don't think we should be giving up those spaces. Again, there is some truth um, to that, but we have to find the right balance. We shouldn't give up all of what's best of us. But we have to be able to understand that for us to continue to be competitive, for us to continue to earn a livelihood out of tourism, we have to learn to coexist with it. With it. So how do we do that? And that's always a challenge for governments. To what ex how do you define the coexistence? We know what happened with the last government, with DSH, and other development that took place in the north, and other developments where they, they seem to have been no regard for an understanding of a balanced co coexistence. For us, we want to, to, to exploit the advantages we have, but we don't want to lose the soul and the essence of who we are as a people. Um, so, you know, I, I can see why some people hold that view, but the reality is that we can't, we're not world class in uh, manufacturing, we're not world class in agriculture. It's probably cheaper to buy a pound of tomatoes from Miami than to buy it from you know, a local farmer. That's the reality of economies of scale. It's not that our local farmers are bad. It's not that they, they, they cannot do better. The economies of scale suggest that somebody who has you know, 20, 30,000 acres can produce one pound of tomatoes cheaper than somebody that has you know, quarter acre. That, that's just economics. But we know when it comes to tourism, not many places in the world can better us at this. And therefore, we have to make use of it because it generates the income that keeps this country going, at least at this stage, until we find an alternative. It was not always tourism. At one time, it was the banana industry. At one time, it was, but that's no longer the case. We we're going to try financial services. Watch what happened with the OECD and all the restrictions and virtually shut down that industry. We're trying to diversify and go into CIP and other investments and look at what they're trying to do to also shut down those things. They've not been able to shut down our tourism. So we have to be able to manage it and to make sure it works for us and our people can benefit. But we have to pay salaries. We have to build roads. We have to take care of our, our hospitals and our school, our teachers. And right now, tourism is what offers us the best, the best avenue to do so. Concerned that you're losing public buy-in. Now that's that, that's another di now excellent. That's another dimension. So when I became minister and prime minister, and I spoke about tourism and where we wanted to go, one of the first things we were concerned about, one of the first things I asked my ministry and the tourism authority was to start a national public education campaign about a people's tourism, a real tourism, a tourism that places its central focus on the people, because I believe. If our people understand that this is an economic opportunity to better their lives and not to feel that they are estranged from the process, we can have a better tourism and our people can benefit more, which is why we invest in the community tourism, why we invest in, in giving concessions to ordinary solutions to invest more and to own more of the tourism industry. Because we have to show our people that they can benefit more from tourism. It is why we lobby in you know, the hotels and other service providers who pay higher salaries to our people. 
So our people can benefit more from it. As long as our people cannot see greater benefits and see an attempt has been made for them to get greater benefits, they will always be cynical about it, and rightfully so. So we must fight for them. We must fight for better salaries. We must fight for more opportunities. Government must give more support, incentives, financial. So our people, because watch, that's, that, that's our natural resource. We don't have diamonds, we don't have oil, we don't have all those natural resources. Our natural resources, our tourism, our extraordinary physical beauty, and the warmth and welcoming nature of our people. That's what we have. But our people should own more of it. Our people should benefit more from it. And for me, that's the kind of tourism I want. And I think the more we can achieve that is the less naysayers we will have. So you're saying, so ecotourism will have to play a major part yeah, it, it is, it is, it is. You, you cannot have a sustainable tourism without having a focus on ecotourism. Now, I'm not saying all tourism should become ecotourism, people put in have a sack and walking up the hills, what not. You have to have multiple dimensions, which is why we push in the mice, we push in religious tourism, we push in, you know, the diving sector, and all the dimensions must be present. In terms of those, speaking about ecotourism, in terms of structural development, in St. Lucia's interior, because I know the majority of our island is forested and mountainous in, in the interior. Are there any plans to do anything inside like the, the middle of the country? Or no, we, we shouldn't. Like we shouldn't because that's part of what we're offering. Because if you look at some of the island, islands around us, they have beautiful beaches. And some islands have more beautiful beaches than us. But not many islands, maybe not, no other in the Eastern Caribbean has the balance that St. Lucia has. Beautiful beaches, forests, waterfalls, rivers, the same interior that you speak of, yeah, they have no other island in the Eastern Caribbean. The only other island I believe that can rank if that balance is Jamaica. No other island can boast of that balance that St. Lucia has. And when you add to that our cultural expressions, we unsurpass, you know, we, total, we unsurpass. So um, St. Lucia in the next five years or so, if we continue on the trajectory that we are on, um, will become the premier destination. In um, you indicated that your ministry, or you will inquire on the establishment of a rafting business in the Roseau area. Uh, uh, your predecessor, your ministerial predecessor, responded uh, by, by indicating that he will have conversations with his legal advisors to have that comment from the House removed from the record. What is your response to his uh, his posture concerning that uh, uh, pending investigation? Uh, well, I'll tell you something. Uh, I try to avoid even giving any semblance of, of, of attention to the former minister. Um, I think, you know, the more I, he realizes that the possibilities for him and his party are diminishing, is the more outlandish he will become in the things that he, he, he says. Um, all I can say to him is, please go to your lawyer and ask your lawyer to seek to remove the comments. I will pay the lawyer for him if he wants. Okay. What can I say? But will this investigation, this audit, well, proceed? Well, I I, I, yeah, I mean, let, 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 him, let him continue to, to masquerade and see what comes out of it, um, because that's all he's doing. Um, but let him proceed. If he, let him go to his lawyer and ask his lawyer to get it removed. And like I tell him, I will help him pay the lawyer. Um, that's how much I want him to try to get the comments removed. I just got a top story there. Let me see if I can help him out. One more. Um, CIP skeptics, opposition detractors continue to bastardize the CIP, uh, painting it as something, something dirty. And whenever uh, a territory with CIP comes under some sort of sanction or pressure, mm. St. Lucia needs to be mentioned uh, St. Mention Lucia's name in uh, that maybe you might have some sort of similar fate or yeah. similar sanction currently or in your, in your time overseeing CIP has St. Lucia come under any sanction? Uh, what is the status of the CIP program? Is it healthy? Is, your, is the administration you're a part of maybe considering winding it down, wrapping it up? Where are we with CIP? Well, I, I can say I'm very proud of our CIP. Um, when we started in 2016, we had a particular framework which we thought was robust, rigid, and was designed to test, you know, 
any all the challenges that would be out there. Some changes were made to it. We didn't agree with the changes. Um, but since then, time has moved on. It's almost, it's almost impossible to go back to the original shape and form that we had because the industry has just changed so much. But St. Lucia has remained um, a destination that is known for its emphasis on due diligence and its emphasis on, um, you know, transparency, whatnot. So I'm still very proud of, of the work we've done in that regard. And we continue to be seen as a destination that places extraordinary emphasis on those aspects. But we also wanted as a government to make sure that the CIP can start delivering directly to the people of St. Lucia, not simply by raising revenue that goes to the Treasury, but to start making some direct contributions. And we have made some adjustments. And during the budget presentation, the Prime Minister will make some major announcements as to projects that will commence in this country through the CIP. Uh, and I'm really happy we've been able to, to, to reach that point because you see in the other islands housing projects and roads and bridges and factories and schools and hospitals have been built through the CIP. We never had that in St. for five years under the last government. Um, and I think we're going to reach a point now in St. Lucia where we can make a couple of big announcements on projects that will be funded directly. So in addition to contributing to revenue, you will also see um, direct projects for the benefit of the people of St. Lucia. Okay, going back to tourism, the discussion about it being the main revenue in St. Lucia, we see all these plans to develop tourism and basically put St. Lucia on the map. But um, the reality is where we are located and we're in El Nino, we're looking at an early stop. One incident and everything's gone. What's the plan? What's the backup plan? Well, the backup plan in terms of tourism, because you know, and let me take an op the opportunity to just reflect on this, because that's one of the criticisms people have sometimes that tourism can be so fickle. One incident and it's gone. And I say to them, when we had the banana industry, one storm and what happens? It's gone. Same way, so tourism is no less, no more fickle than the banana industry was. And we've had many instances, many instances with the banana industry where we had Tropical Storm, Debbie, we had, you know, Thomas, we had so many of them that destroyed the, the banana industry. It took us nine months to recover because the plant took nine months before it can bear again. COVID just showed us something with tourism. It's a lot more resilient and a lot more adaptive than we believe it is because within weeks of we starting to allow op weeks of opening our borders people started coming back so the tourism industry is a lot more um, adaptive and resilient than anybody ever thought it was uh, and i think that taught us um, that tourism is not what we we believe it is in fact the banana industry was more um you know inflexible and, and more, you know, exposed and vulnerable than the tourism industry was. And if we could get a competitive advantage in manufacturing, I think we should pursue it. We already have a few success stories in St. Lucia, Baron Foods and a few others. We need to build on that. We need to build on it. But we have to find ways of producing cheaper than other places in the world. Because if you can't produce jams and produce um, sauces and produce, you know, sausages and whatever you produce, if you can't do it cheaper than the rest of the world, nobody will buy your products. Nobody will buy your product. So we have to be mindful of that. So the plan B really is for us to build a resilience in the industry and for us to have the capacity to come back when we face challenges. Now, until we can find a more competitive industry, whether in agriculture, whether in manufacturing, then we really don't have any option. I would love to see us introduce more technology in agriculture so that we can produce, and not just produce, you have to be able to export. Because if you think about it, the country earns money when it exports. Tourism is an export industry. It's true people come in here, but it's foreigners coming in here in exchange for a service and they pay us. So in a sense, we are exporting a, 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 a service. We have to be able to export, producing and not exporting, you're not earning. 
even think about it, and which is why a lot of the countries that have developed in Asia and other parts of the world, they spoke of export-led development because that's how the country earns more and more, is by producing to sell to the rest of the world. So we do not just have to produce to take care of ourselves, which we must do, but we have to also produce to export and to, to earn. Well, I think St. Lucia is very involved in the situation in Haiti. As you know, Dr. Ken Anthony, a former prime minister, is part of the eminent persons group that is assisting um, with the situation in Haiti. And right now, he is in Haiti with other Caribbean leaders um, trying to resolve the situation in Haiti. It is, from all indications, a very complicated issue, very, very complicated. Um, but CARICOM is heavily engaged. Um, together with other international partners, the UN, the US, Kenya, um, to try and find a way of restoring um, normalcy in, in Haiti. Um, it's unfortunate the situation that Haiti is in, um, and we all grieve for, for Haiti when we hear of the challenges that they face, and we really hope that they can have a, a sense of normalcy and life can return to what um, persons want, you know, especially in the in the capital. So St. Lucia is very involved, very engaged. The Prime Minister is very engaged in what's going on and he's regularly briefed on what's happening. And like I said, Dr. Kenny Anthony is in Jamaica now um, as they try to lend support to create that transition that is needed in Haiti. Could you see us possibly opening our borders to refugees or is that possible? Um, I have not seen any, any reason to believe that is on the table. Um, so I can't comment on it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you.